uh, I, we're technically into our 15 minute uh, discussion session now. Um, we can, you know, if there are further questions for Austin, that's fine, but also, you know, field questions for, for many of the um, speakers from this, this session. Or any thoughts or ideas, I guess, too. Was there, okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Lee. Oh, okay, go, go, go ahead. Uh, a question, and I guess this is for Aaron, is um, with the deep field, so to what extent is the, um, is the high latitude time domain survey doing the deep field that you want, and to what extent isn't it? I and mean, certainly if, if Roman's spending whatever, a year uh, of time observing the, the supernova fields, uh, we, any uh, very deep field science, we certainly want to build around that to some degree. And I had the, almost the same corollary question. Of that which it's doing, what would you want to add, like say the K-band, for example? Yeah, I honestly have to catch up with what the plans is with the time domain survey, but my impression is it would take them a long time to build up that depth. So that's why I think there's a chance to build up the depth a little sooner or quicker um, with the wide area survey. Now with the new KBAN, we haven't talked enough about what's the best strategy to add it to the field. Of course, a lot of people have expressed the interest um, deep or in the wide tier that they can make really good use of the KBAN data. So um, we just have to figure out how much time we can blow on it because you know this is not a deep survey. It's the high latitude wide area survey. But of course, a deep field will be helpful for many ways, um, you know, in many ways for calibration, for um, many other things. So yeah, we'll keep planning. Since we're on this topic, I wanted to ask a question to Jeff, um, which is if we're considering um, an ultra deep field, um, where is the power for um, calibration? How long would it take us to really be able to fully exploit um, a deep field? I mean, does the calibration data that we would need come from the deep field observation itself, or is it a, um, uh, something that we would get over a slightly longer period of time from some of the other surveys? So <clears throat> there's several calibrations that one might envision. If you're thinking about astrophysical calibrations, those have generally been thought of over a somewhat larger and shallower area than one would do in an ultra deep field. So there might be some astrophysical things that are as yet unknown unknowns that might come from that, but I would think that that's not where people's thinking has been going. I don't know, David, if you want to add to that. Well, just in the kind of very general sense of, you know, if you're, if you're interested in calibration information for, you know, a survey of some depth, you, you probably want some smaller area going, you know, four or five times deeper, um, but not necessarily going, you know, 20 times deeper uh, because it's, it's just not, Overlapping, so to, so that's that's why I'm kind of asking specifically about the the time domain survey because I mean I think at at 10 or 20 square degrees those are things that we'll be using for calibrating the wide area survey, but at two square degrees you know probably not. Um, I mean it'll be useful, but but if you were designing something just for doing the calibration. My guess is similar to what Jeff was saying is is you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't go as deep over over that narrow an area as as you're talking about. Questions. I guess I had a question about the uh, you know the Roman deep field as well. So. Um, you know, it's going to be a deep field and it's going to be a very wide field too, right? But it's not going to be probably quite as deep as, as some of the JWST stuff. And so, 
you know, is the Rome and deep field going to help with some of this, you know, population statistics at very high redshifts of these, you know, massive quiescent galaxies that are somewhat surprising, I guess. Yeah, those stuff are rare. So JWST can see a few of them, but I, I don't think, I think we're really far from robust statistics, let alone a luminosity function, right? Especially on the bright end, we just there's no way we can constrain how many sources are there. And the early universe is hard because everything is lower mass, everything is fainter because they're far away, and everything is rarer. So we kind of need both to do the science. So one reason why we should do a deep field early on. <laughs> I just had a a, a non deep field comment. <laughs> you, so really, it's for you, Chang, for you. So the numbers you were quoting, you know, it's it's not as help, hopeless as you thought at the end there. Those, those spectroscopic numbers are, are the numbers we're using to meet the requirements for the redshift survey. So it could go deeper. And obviously, in any sort of deeper field, you'll get a lot better. So, and, and the whole, and, and another axis. So I'm encouraging you to explore, because I think you're in a really interesting regime with those faint galaxies that you will be able to do a lot. And, and, and the other axis that you didn't mention is the spectra also give you, besides just the star formation rate, if you can get multiple lines, you'll be able to isolate the sources that have line ratios that indicate feedback is very important. So, you know, anomalous N2 over H alpha or O1 over H alpha, if you're lucky enough to get those lines, you'll be able to pick those out as well. So it gives you another thing to play with. Um, thanks, Lee. Yes, uh, the number uh, 10 to minus 16 erg per second per centimeter square is uh, just a reference uh, value I picked up from a fact sheet of uh, um, Roman. So uh, it would be great if we can push it down by another factor of 10. If we can go down to 10 to minus 17, that's more or less the depth of uh, 3D HST. Um, but uh, if you ask me, so uh, 3D HST is a still a shallow uh, Grisma survey, um, I mean, for low mass galaxies. So um, with Roman, um, for example, I'm interested in low mass galaxies at the ratio of the one or two. So um, if we are able to push the uh, line flux limit even further down, that would be great. And also that would help the science you mentioned, the spatially resolved uh, SED and so because when you go to small scale, the star formation rate is even lower, so that requires a, um, lower um, emission line sensitivity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Questions online at the end? No. Okay. Okay, so to um, add a little bit to the talk I gave in the morning, so, so basically these luminous infrared galaxies, they are pretty rare locally, but then when you take the footprint of, of the wide area survey, th there are actually like, like tens of thousands of these galaxies uh, in, in, the, in the footprint, uh, so, the, so the very rare galaxies are not, not rare anymore when, when you have such a wide field. Uh, um, and then in, in the local, lo locally we, ha we have basically seen that these galaxies are not not staying constant over time. So, so we say, see that they actually change over time. So we have, we have supernova factories there, we have uh, tidal disruption events, we have active galactic nuclei and so on. So many things actually changing as a function of time. So I, so I think this, this is like one example that if, if there is a possibility to actually make the wide area survey time domain, we will, we will get a lot of in interesting science out. Uh, and, and then my question is that because I, I haven't heard so much about, uh, about time domain for the wide area survey in this conference. So, so I'm wondering if there are other, other um, uh, ideas what you can actually do with the wide area survey, some, some, some rare, rare types of uh, uh, objects uh, that you can only do in the wide area. That you can't, can't actually do in the, in the high latitude time domain survey because of the, of the small, small field of view. I think there must be other examples as well. So it's, it's a question uh, if uh, others have ideas uh, for, for this as well, in addition to the lum luminous infrared galaxies aspect. Thank you.
the closest. Yeah, the very closest. The very closest. So, so I think, I mean, with, within 50 megaparsec, uh, we, we have few examples. So we have, for instance, this ARP 299. I was using as an example, I think we have NCC 3256, uh, so we have few examples, it's not many, it's, it's handful. Uh, Can you no, I, I think, uh, I think no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so quick question to the Yi Cheng, actually. So, I barely remember. <laughs> But uh, I was actually uh, curious about like um, uh, the quenching scenario that like uh, as a, a galactic star formation scientist, like the star formation quenching is always related to the, uh, uh, mic uh, the what is it, the magnetic field and also the uh, uh, and also like the feedback basic and, and also like the gravitational force. But like uh, the probably one of the easiest way to see that is like a video parameter alpha maybe like comparing in between like a gravitational force to the uh, uh, kinetic energy. So, could you have any chance to look at those kind of like a video, uh, video, visualization of those like the galaxies to see if they are realized or not? <laughs> Sorry, uh, can you rephrase the last part? If the galaxies are yeah, so so for the the star formation quenching, uh, the in the uh. uh Galactic, I mean the Milky Way star formation point of view, it may be related to the uh, largely in between the uh, the gravitational energy and also kinematic energy anyhow. But like if if the other uh, kinematic kinematic energy is like a, a much larger than the other uh, gravitational energy, then like probably I even though we have um the uh, enough uh, mass of the other uh, dust, but uh, probably star formation will be really just disturbed and then do not actually have the other. Uh, uh, the real star formation. So the probably easiest way to, to, to see that is like uh, the visualization of that one. So if, if it is actually having the uh, visualized uh, parameter, uh, the, the video parameter like under one or like uh, more than like a 10, like if we can actually see that, like we can actually uh, say more about this uh, galaxies about the other star formation quenching. So I just wondered if you have any chance to actually look at those like a visualization. Um, so, uh, I guess for um, I think for um, series uh, they 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 must have these numbers to um, translate the uh, um, quenching efficiency into the uh, energy budget as you you said. Um, for my own study, um, I don't have that uh, number in my mind right now because I'm um, looking at uh, the just the morphology change um, along with the quenching. So uh, my uh, focus is more on the, um, the morphology, how the mass density change as a function of a time and uh, uh, whether um, what is the, uh, the energy budget or what is the energy source to make this change. Uh, so that's something I have to talk to serious once I have uh, solid results from uh, the measurement of uh, uh, mass budget. Um, so, uh, I can see something we can do is to uh, go a little bit further from the back of envelope that I showed in my in my talk. Basically, we just uh, calculate the time scale, so you know the uh, mass profile before quenching, and you know the mass profile after quenching. So you assume something happened in the middle, and then we got the time scale. So uh, yes, we can definitely go further to see uh, what is the energy resources for that change. But uh, that will require the comparison with uh, uh, simulations. Okay, so we All can right. talk more about that. Maybe we should yes. uh, continue discussion at lunch here and, and move on to the posters. But let's uh, give a round for, for all the speakers in the session. Thanks. <laughs>